And also, I hope it will be a good follow-up on the previous conversation, because particularly there were a lot of questions from you related how do you test, especially in a distributed environment. Now, I hope I have some, some comments on, uh, on that. Not so much in specific use case, but a bit more in general, although based on some uh, experience of customers, even in the Amsterdam region, or just a circle of 100 kilometers from here. Uh, a little bit of introduction about myself and the people that I brought with me. Uh, ladies first, there's Chantal in the back. Um, she was also very useful to get the connectivity to have us to, uh, to show up. Uh, Ruben, my direct colleague over there. Uh, another person I have to give, although he doesn't work for our organization, I have to give credit to Robert Schrijvers. He is in Sardinia, otherwise he would be maybe the good person to have on the floor. And, uh, and myself, we work for an uh, organization, except Robert. Robert is independent. He has been a power user of our technology at one of our case studies. But uh, Microsoft is a US firm, and we work for the Dutch Benelux office. We look after the market terms called the Nordics, but it is Scandinavia and the Netherlands, okay? Now, a little bit, Microsoft is a uh, software vendor. We do sell licenses, which we do have to buy. Yes, although we invest a lot in our people. Um, no, no, I mean, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's a classic company. We uh, exist almost 30 years this year. Uh, we have a background in parallel computing. That's where the name comes from. But that's uh, not of today, but it stands for parallel software in the past. And since the founding, we've started on building tools to test software, so test automation, which has been a discipline for a long time. We have a background in testing embedded code, so C++, finding memory leaks. Maybe you've heard of a tool called Insure++. That was our cornerstone product, still still very viable, and competed with Purify, Microsoft Purify, Bounce Checker, yeah. and those are tools to analyze, to find runtime issues in code, because C is very open in memory management, and therefore, mistakes there. But that's, let's say, to give you a piece, that is a bit a type of technology that we, uh, that we have. And we expanded that over the years to go into uh, static code analysis, dynamic code analysis, unit test generation, but the topic of today is a bit more, what well, now we would call API testing, could be REST API, but there are far more in that sense interfaces out there. And so that sense, uh, people are communicating information already since the well, last, last century, in the 80s. So there's a lot of technology out there, called it legacy, and therefore we have developed engines that either play the role of a test engine or a stubbing engine. And the stubbing engine will be the main uh, driver behind the case, the case that I will present. Okay? This is then the last, let's say, more marketing slide. <coughs> I already uh, do a little bit on the, on the right-hand side, so we have tools to help you build software. It gets a lot of attention in the safety, safety critical market, automotive, you name it, but the world that you live in, not so much your world. So there are uh, very regulated industries out there. So there is then the boogeyman, and the boogeyman wants to see proof, and then you have to have software to show that you've done the homework. And another world, and that's the world that I mostly come from, and this test environment isolation, that's in a way the theme of today. And we like to do as much so test automation to support the teams uh, testing in your agile and DevOps initiatives. So that's, let's say, the second half, the second business plan of the company. Okay? So that's about, so far, the, the, the hard marketing. Now, I already picked up, but who is programming something like this? With this, I mean, a, a, let's say, well, not even a monolith, but almost a standalone. Maybe a very powerful, maybe a very clever algorithm. But that's often what we don't do anymore. We have, and I looked it up on the website today, for example, Backbase. Are there Backbase people in the room? They do, yeah. So they help you to automate backends of, uh, of bags and to make it easier to have your channels uh, available. But it actually is about these arrows. Yeah? It also bit more already previous arrows, although they're mostly internal arrows. And uh, but in the world, yeah? other parts you have arrows to your own legacy apps, your backend, backend systems. Now I know one little bit from the semi-past. Apparently actually learned some of the things you've got to tell you today. I learned from this and his colleagues. Every day you have a board could also be you have third party, really third party in the government that's very, very prominent that you have to look up. 
in, in general databases, but also in the financial world, your, uh, what is it, your credit ratings, if you like it or not, you know, that is being checked. And those are all these arrows, these diagrams, and these arrows that makes me happy because maybe we can help with testing those arrows. And there's another diagram that I, um, let's say, got friendly from, uh, from one of our customers. This is not so much an architecture diagram, this is a flow diagram of the system. So all these, these codes are pieces of software. A lot of technologies, also let's say what we call a legacy, uh, because this telco already exists for a couple of years. But this is the systems that are involved if you, if you do number portability. So you go from one operator to the other, then there has to be number, number portability, and then there are a lot of parties involved to get that number portability. So if they would like to see how does this number portability flow, they have to have a test environment up and running where all these calls are present, are able to talk to each other, and are also synchronized in data. I might be wrong, but some of the questions I picked up, you know, I could relate to these type of questions which many of my customers have, and where we try to help them in solving, especially on the boundaries, all the APIs, but on the boundaries where these applications communicate with each other. Yes, so that's just not relevant. You have an early evening. And this is also fascinating, and it has to be lucky because, well, yeah, almost lucky, because we have this traditional exposure to the embedded software industry. It's in Holland very much centered around Eindhoven, because of historic reasons. And of course in Germany, very prominent. But yes, your car is already you know, a driving computer, what? Maybe driving 100 computers, but all still very locally connected, courtesy of your common bus. Now, I can tell you after that I had my car actually had a one component that was actually sending wrong messages. I lost the car two days, to, just to find back where that was disturbing. Was the end was the AES system that was sitting. Uh, so my car had to drive, but all the other features didn't work because somebody was just throwing dirt at the canvas. So I lost power steering and everything, but the car still broke. But that is now getting, you know, there is a complete other type of communication getting, getting out there. And so even this connectivity, the video problem in the IT world, that's very common in your world, is now getting very, very heavy also. It's a non traditional. Call it IoT. <coughs> no, that's a, it's a high word, but this in a way is an example. So, but there's also places where this technology can be very interesting. And I think somebody in the room will now start to laugh. <laughs> because this is how we're going to do this. Photo of last month, uh, Saturday morning. So I think these problems are getting worse. In that sense, that software is off. Yeah. So in this, this case, it was BMW actually got this whole navigation system. And he was pretty happy because the guys were professionals. They did it very nicely. They only took out what they really needed. I mean, this is... Okay, fascinating. Yeah, okay, it's a bit too, too sad to see, but this is the world where we all live in. Yeah, so these are kind of the high-level topics that we would like to go through. Rob and I originally developed it for the Philosophy Conference last year. It was the first time we did this. A couple of weeks back, there was kind of DevOps finished delivery in Berlin, where I more or less took a well, limited set of slides. But that's kind of the world where we talked about this, this technology. I guess. Now, once upon a time, I think you refer to that a bit, and you call it a monolith, well, in the more financial world, you call it silos. Yeah, well, I told you I would, I would pitch you. Yeah, but that's a typical, a typical thing, and we are, well, we look at it, we call it legacy, like it was bad. A few la uh, large applications. On the other hand, this is, uh, life was maybe not so difficult back then. And then it looked very difficult, but compared to what we do nowadays, you know, we do things differently in getting new problems. So that's why I'm out. Uh, what is now more modern times? Uh, so you think we call everything APIs, apps and APIs, instead of applications. Yeah, but we have now diagrams, landscapes like this. People that work here in the environment might recognize some of the, of the abbreviations and the protocols being used. And that's not coincidence, so it's an abstract vision of the background of a large retail bank. Here in Amsterdam, where we've learned a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today. But this is more the world and what I have to deal with. But you can also link it back to the telco with its flows. And then we put an agile process, or maybe a different process, on top of this. And that's then the whole thing. But these things, that's it. These groups, the DevOps teams, if you are fundamentalists, they also look after production. 
no uh, debates about it, but the principle that's assume that, and they all have their own cycle speeds. And then I have to give Robert credit for this. People recognize this picture. All right. If you have to remember one thing of today, look up, type in modern times, Charlie Chaplin. 1960, 1960, 1936, I think. Give or take one year. He has this, yeah, he is this operator of this of this machine, and everything turns in, turns in nuts, of course. But in a way, these are more or less modern times. All these, all these wheels, all this pump, uh, pump wheel, and they they turn all at around the speed. We want to have them as independent as, as possible, and they have different cycle speeds. However, and we want to have these principles as often early as possible. That's what we want. To do that, we have to decouple them. We have to, <coughs> almost like maybe jealous if you have the luxury that you can decouple them. Not everybody has the luxury to decouple them. And that's where that's our idea. So we want to be this oil in that machine and to smoothen out these different speeds and then to use virtualization, which is also a heavy overload of work. In our market is now called service virtualization due to our other vendors that also try to push through licenses. Firstly, I don't like the term too much, but that's now how people talk about it. It's often functionality is exposed as a service, so therefore you virtual services. But it's more interface simulation. I think simulation emulation is a, almost a better term to think about it. Okay. The term is now service virtualization. But what you would like, the goal is oil in this machine is to make sure that you know can slow down by other people because you have to wait, take the wait for data to be provisioned or versions to be in sync. Yeah? Or that you say, well, that it forces you to skip things that you prefer to do early because but you can do low test because the acceptance test about was not ready. No? And hopefully you can get better test coverage if you're able to decouple yourself with different yeah. And in the remainder, I would like to show you some of these principles in the different test phases that people normally go through. Yeah. And on the back side, but that is a bit before the audio audience, we try to collect some, let's say, requirements, what is then required for an engine, and we have one of those engines, to make sure that they are available to do this in this world. Yeah. But there are some things that you need to do, because the world is not only REST, and that you have to be able to, to mimic, otherwise you cannot deliver this promise. It's schematic, how these things uh, look like. We have an application of test, being tested by, uh, by software from us or from our, from our friends, and then only go to a backend or multiple backends of your own third party. They are the guys that give you issues, so you want to take them out. And that's the whole idea. And you want to take them out in such a way that they are reasonable, now go to the, and that they are good simulators for the things that you want to, to mimic, and somebody has to create these, well, in our term, we call them virtual assets, stubs, well, mocks, and get a whole definition, but the principles should be simulators of the behavior that is then good enough so that this guy doesn't see a difference. Now, and this is then, this is for me a bit work in progress, this is a bit based on, on experience. I put some Dutch words because that for me has the most semantics because that's what I need to thought. But there are, let's say, different ways to create these, these simulators. One would be as you do top down, just like you design a test case, top down. Yeah? And then it's like you predict it for seven. Yeah? So you design not your test case, but your stub case. And, and here, I put it there. Everybody knows about the Turing test. That's the other thing you might not know. Uh, look up at it. Alan Turing thought, well, how can we make distinction between artificial intelligence and human? That's what would be the, when do we call something intelligent? Well, okay, some debate if this is the right definition, but this definition was if there is an observer, C, that would, through a kind of interface or some paper, talks to either a real human or a simulated human, in this person cannot see the difference that this, this machine, number A, is therefore intelligent. And that was for him to do this. And that's a bit what you have here, because you often say we simulate this backend. So where you want to predict that all the questions that we're going to ask it, you stop them. It says the right answer. Now yeah, you have a risk that you start to overmodel, you start to rebuild, for example, in our engine, the core functionality. Yeah? But that's one way of approaching things. You don't say it's wrong, but you might come into a problem that you want to predict too much. Now, the other way around, and that's often uh, demo, people like to see it, then you say, well, we do record and play that game. Run a regression test, again, real environment, 
and then we recorded the, uh, the traffic, and then we let the stop engine replay it. So it's a bit like a parrot. Napraten. Uh, and I'm now getting a bit more fan, fan of uh, this. This way, and it requires some technology before you can do this. They say, well, we want to do that. They is, is the behavior that we want to have from a stop. We do it, let's say, on the fly. Yeah, I don't know if the is working, but that's what we're going to influence them. You just tell somebody what he needs to say, and then it says it. So on the fly, I'll give you some example later on, but on the fly, you provision your stuff so he knows the test case, the, the, the state that you want to test, and after that, you throw it yeah, Those are a bit, let's say, let's say the core ways that you have to create these sorts of assets. If you do it wrongly, then we have a lot of ways to start to manage users. Because then the test, you don't cover anything. So, yeah, but these are, let's say, some core things you have to think about when you talk about this service visualization and kickers. Now, now I would like to go with you through some slideware to talk about how do this type of thing work in different phases. Additionally, they are also in requirements. I think slowly we start to move away from the concept of an environment to do a certain type of test. It gets a bunch of machines, which you typically would call the test environment or the integration environment. I think that's very really blurry, also due to uh, techniques like Docker that is it's blurry. But let's go through these different testing phases one by one. And what we have seen where service utilization could help and how it's being used. Okay? So back to our uh, abstract bank. We are team B and we are in development. Okay? Now then we do it on our local machine. It's a bit, a bit like your, your situation, but in this case we don't have the luxury we can connect to dev. I think that, that, that relates. But we do know that B talks to, maybe I went too fast, but talks to two sub applications and an O. Uh, and maybe we do it only over HTTP because that's easy for us to do it locally. Then we don't need the TIPCO or a web sphere, if you don't want to pay license like that. Yeah. But we don't need the, the real infrastructure. Uh, but we then keep a light interface because we want to test functionality. And let's say the whole infrastructure part we're going to take later. Yeah, so then you have the simulation engine uh, on the local machine, preferable. You do it for your unit testing, some functional testing, and you are fully decoupled. Yeah, now, that's yeah, very nice, call it uh, stopping. Now go to test, well, or integration test. Yeah, life gets, of course, a bit more interesting. Yeah, still B, we do test. And you say, well, we can test, we also are interested in the connectivity to our neighbors. For me, that by the way, became a rule of thumb. In particular, if you're coming to lots, lots larger landscapes, always deploy the system in the test and its neighbors, and then think about study. Because otherwise, if I would really need an integration find, would like to have n stuffed out and do a full integration test. We have to do a lot of during test work to get a simulator for n good enough that I keep B and O at C. But that's kind of rule of thumb. Let's take the, this one and it's satellite and the rest you can consider to stuff. But this is then, let's say, the picture that you, that you look at. Look at. We now are not on your local laptop anymore, so you get close to what's called a real environment, so there's some kind of pipeline that provisions you new machines to potentially a real data center. So it, of course, it automates the build and deployment of your system. That's cool, because that's under your control. And a lot of automation, in my opinion, what I see is focused on that. But we are, but I said earlier, not alone in the world. So somebody has to also deploy N and O. Maybe N has its own little uh, whatever database underneath that also has to be deployed. And then we say, you know what? The rest can't work for steps. But then we would like, because you are in a real environment, that also the person pipeline uh, publishes, publishes your uh, first class engine, puts the right simulators in that to at least in this setup. Uh, gives the right, uh, right answer when it's being, when it's being called. And then you run your test against B. Now, what are some things to consider in this world? You have to choose your, your, uh, your, your cutoff points. And what we mean, and we have to take the brackets. It's like with mathematics, a certain moment you put your brackets, and that defines the scope of your calculation. And here, and that's the uh, that's where the expert comes in, so this makes sense. Yes, of course, you deploy your system in the test, that's the goal. And rule of thumb is neighbors, and for the rest you do with the stubbing engine. Yeah. What is then required for the stubbing engine? Because you do want to have a real integration test, so you will have the real queues involved, you will have the real uh, 
TIPCO, uh, MQ, uh, SONIC, whatever you use in Wolf. The queues have to be there. This mapping has to be done automatically. Ridiculous if you have to do still this mapping manually. No? And then, of course, for the engine, 